And I want to give you a warm welcome and thank all of you for joining us on this Wednesday evening. My name is Davina Kuppen, and I'm the Head Start Program Director at the City of Oakland. This is our second Oakland Early Learning Symposium workshop for this year. The planning team wants to thank you for continuing to make these events so successful. Before we get into some meeting housekeeping though, I want to touch on our topic tonight, building community with LGBTQ plus families in your early care and education program. Our goal is for you to come to a better understanding of LGBTQ plus identity. We will also learn how to use inclusive language with children, parents, and staff. And we will develop some grounding principles for conversations about gender, love, and families in age-appropriate ways. I want to acknowledge that as with all professional development topics, there are some of us here tonight who may have a better understanding of this topic than others, and that's okay. We're here to grow and learn with each other. I also want to acknowledge that across our nation, we've seen conversations related to LGBTQ plus community turn very divisive and ugly. This leads me to remind everyone that the Oakland Early Learning Symposium is a place for early learning professionals to learn and share with each other. And we do that by showing each other respect, understanding, and grace. I'm confident that you will approach our conversations tonight with openness to new ideas and a commitment to listening to each other with thoughtful consideration. And the reason I'm confident you'll do this is that you encourage children in your care and their families to do the same every day. And that's what's so wonderful about being early learning professional. So with that, before we move on, there are a few other announcements. A reminder, an exciting one, that all of tonight's participants are invited to attend an in-person companion event that we're hosting this weekend. The second Saturday Symposium Social, Bags, Books and Breakfast, will be held this Saturday, April 29th, from 10 to noon in the parking lot of Bananas, Inc. We'll be giving away a bag of children's books related to our topic today and some other goodies. We'll also have a few organizations present to provide additional resources for you. And of course, there will be breakfast. So it's not a formal program for this event. You can drop by at any time between 10 and noon on Saturday. It's an opportunity for you to network and receive more information about this really important topic. So if you've not already registered for this event, you can do so by clicking on the link that is in the chat. And just a note for you that you must attend the event to receive the free giveaways. We're not, unfortunately, not able to arrange an alternative time for the pickup. So this Saturday, exciting Saturday event is really an example of how throughout the pandemic, we've tried to find ways to support the ECE community in Oakland. There's another effort that's called Let's Talk Early Learning. Let's Talk sessions are held in the evenings on Zoom and are informal ways for you to get to know each other. In the early learning professionals get to talk about subjects that are at the top of your mind for this field. Our wonderful facilitators for Let's Talk, Annette Wright, Ivane Garcia, Nini Humphrey, Jaquetta Wallace, have made these events fun and informative. And Ivane hosts in Spanish, which is new this year. Uh, we're now offering professional development credits for these events. The next Let's Talk is Monday, May 8th at 6 p.m. So give it a try. Uh, we're dropping the registration in the chat right now and we'll be sending out the link to that event this week. So for more background and some more house, uh, some meeting housekeeping, we're going to Drew from Oakland Unified School District who's co-facilitating with me today. Drew? Hello and thank you, Davina. And welcome everyone. It is so great to see you all. Thank you for being here. 
I also wanted to take a moment to thank Tandem Partners in Early Learning for making the book giveaway possible for Saturday's event and to Bananas for hosting. It will be really nice to see everyone in person. My name is Drew Giles and I serve as the Director of Quality Enhancement and Professional Development in Oakland Unified School District's Early Learning Department. Now on to some housekeeping for our symposium. We will have a specific time for questions. If you have a question during the Q&A, please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature and clicking on the reactions button and clicking raise hand option just below the emojis and we will unmute you. You can also ask questions in the chat. We will do our best to answer all questions, but some may need follow-up. This symposium is being recorded and will be shared widely, so please keep that in mind as you participate. During the presentations, you do not need your video on, but please turn them on during the breakout sessions happening later this evening. The breakout sessions will not be recorded. We know that many of you are joining us tonight will be receiving professional development credits and those certificates will be emailed to you right after today's event. We will also be sending out some resources that are shared tonight in an email. So please keep a check or please check your inboxes. Before we get started, I wanted to thank the Rainin Foundation and the Packard Foundation for supporting the symposium. Also, there are so many organizations throughout our beautiful city of Oakland that participated in making this event happen, and you can see their names listed here on the slide. We want to recognize at the beginning of our session tonight the historical injustices. Please take a moment to locate the native land that you are on right now by going to the link that we will put into the chat. And please take a moment to add the lands that you're on right now to the chat. We would also like to recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which our country was built. We remember that our country was built on the labor of enslaved people, primarily of African descent, and recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all immigrant and indigenous labor who contributed to the building of this country and continue to serve within our labor workforce. We acknowledge labor inequities and the shared responsibility for combating oppressive systems in our daily work. Before we begin our program tonight, we would like to share why this topic is so important to two of the largest providers of preschool in Oakland, the Oakland Unified School District, and the City of Oakland Head Start. Davina, why don't you go ahead and share first? Thanks, Drew. Um, so for City of Oakland Head Start, the reason why this is so important is a key goal for us is to create a welcoming and inclusive environment that engages all families in our program. Um, our program partners with caregivers to create the safe and nurturing environment for their children. And these safe environments really include ensuring that the space has, that we have equality, respect, and dignity for family members, children, and staff. We do this by focusing on family strength. Um, we work with caregivers who identify as LGBTQ plus with goals and dreams and concerns about their children's and children and families. And we really want to help children be able to learn to speak up for themselves and to speak up for others. We want to help children feel proud of who they are and their families. And this topic is so important because we want Oaklanders to know that our Head Start program is a safe space where children can come to you if they feel hurt or confused by another child's comments about something they saw or experienced. And so when we had at the city, um, you know, a workshop on sexual orientation, gender, identity, and expression, one of the key messages that many uh, who are on this symposium training uh, mentioned is that they wanted a safe environment for the team to feel free to ask questions, discuss values, and share different opinions and attitudes. And just to note that this symposium is that environment. So 
you know, from our side, we want to encourage you to ask your questions, discuss with your teams, and we're excited for you to bring those ideas back to our program so that we can implement those together and make sure that we can create that welcoming and inclusive environment that ensures that all our children and families can thrive. So thank you for the chance to share that, Drew, back to you. Thank you, Davina. At OUSD, we take pride in our beautiful diversity. OUSD's Early Learning Department is committed to anti-racist, anti-bias, and anti-hate pedagogy that honors individuals from all backgrounds, cultures, and lived experiences. We strive to be a place where not only all of our children and families feel safe, seen, and reflected within the school environment and curriculum, but we also strive for all of our educators to feel seen and heard in everything they do. Oakland has a rich history in the civil rights and social justice movements. At OUSD, we are committed to maintaining a discrimination-free learning environment that teaches respect for all individuals, including those who do not conform to traditional gender role stereotypes. Further, we as educators are obligated to make our schools safe and welcoming for all students, their families, and our staff. We strive to create a welcoming school environment for all individuals, including the LGBTQ plus community, which means that we embrace and honor all identities, including but not limited to race, religion, age, ability, culture, family structure, gender, nationality, ethnicity, and orientation. By honoring and celebrating all beautiful identities, we will create spaces that welcome everyone. Given the growing number of LGBTQ plus households, we as early childhood educators also need to examine our practices and pedagogy to ensure that we cultivate environments that are welcoming for all families. In addition, there are many opportunities for collaborating and building relationships between educators, schools, and families. This empowers children and strengthens our ability to respond to our family's diverse needs. And I'm also pleased to share that during the 2023-24 school year, we plan to partner with community organizations and the Human Rights Campaign to offer staff de uh, professional development sessions that center on LGBTQ plus inclusive practices, embracing all families and gender inclusive schools. Now, to the moment you've been waiting for, we are very fortunate to have our two presenters with us tonight who worked very hard to put a wonderful presentation together for you. Don Edwards is the Director of Programs at Lotus Bloom. Don is very active in the Oakland community and she has been known as, or she has been a Know Your Rights trainer working against police misconduct and is trained as a Restorative Justice Circle Coordinator a peer facilitator, and she is currently on the board of directors at the Oakland LGBTQ Community Center. Dawn has a master's in educational leadership with an emphasis in early childhood education from Mills College, a master of public administration, and has worked with youth for over 20 years from dance and gymnastics as an instructor to a lead daycare teacher. Don is joined tonight by Nathaniel Flynn. Nathaniel has been a preschool teacher for over 15 years. He has a master's degree in early childhood education from Mills College and a teaching certificate from Froebel College at Roehampton University. He is a member of Gender Justice in Early Childhood, a, coll a, a, collabor a collective of educators, researchers, therapists, academics, artists, and activists dedicated to supporting gender diversity and gender justice in early childhood through community-engaged scholarship, training, resource creation, and more. He co-authored a book entitled Supporting Gender Diversity in Early Childhood Classrooms, a Practical Guide. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Davina. Thank you, everyone who took so uh, to put a lot of time and, and effort into making this symposium possible. 
possible. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. So this slide, uh, keep an open mind. It's the only way new things can get in. This is one of my favorite slides because, you know, when it comes to having courageous conversations, when it comes to having uh, dialogues about topics that we may not necessarily be familiar with or maybe slightly uncomfortable or just a new perspective, a new way of thinking, um, this is something that I always like to keep in mind. Um, the only way to get things in is if we keep an open mind and an open heart. Um, and having an open heart and having love for our community, love for the families and children that we serve, this is the, the real reason why we are all here today. Next slide, please. So I would really love to start with some community guidelines. And I'm sure a lot of us are familiar uh, with bringing values to conversations that we have with one another. So the first one is to use I statements. Try to speak from personal experience. Confidentiality. What is said in the breakout rooms will remain there. We want to make sure, as Davina said, that when you're having these conversations, and this is really an opportunity for us to come together as peers to really learn from one another but we do want to create a space where we feel comfortable and safe in having these courageous conversations. Respect. We want to make sure that we respect everyone's different thoughts, beliefs, perspectives, et cetera. And be non-judgmental. It's, it's true that we all may have different thoughts, different opinions, um, but let's make sure we come here with very good intent. And let's make sure that we create spaces where we can learn from one another. Step up, step back. Um, if you're in a breakout room and you find that you may be sharing a little bit more than someone else, let's make sure we create space for everyone to be able to share. And if you don't feel that comfortable sharing and you would rather just listen and gain some new perspectives and new knowledge, that is completely fine as well. And the last one, let's be patient with one another. We all are coming here to learn. We're all coming here to share our love of the community, our love for families and children. And so sometimes you may hear a perspective that may be different from your own, maybe slightly you're not quite sure if you understand where that person is coming from, but let's just make sure that we're patient with one another. Next slide, please. And I'll pass it to Nathaniel. Yeah, thank you. And that we're just wanting to give you a, a moment to get a sense of what the presentation is going to be about. So we want you to, to, we'll take some time to gain better understanding of different types of LGBTQ plus identities, and particularly thinking about the perspectives of young children in early childhood education. We want you to have a chance to reflect on age appropriate and inclusive approaches to communication with our families and one another, and to leave with strategies on how to foster conversations about gender and family diversity, and to respond with questions, or just respond when questions and discomfort come up. So that'll, that'll be the flow of this presentation as well as our goals for what you have to walk away with from this evening. Brings us back to our why. Why is this important for us? As educators, providers of family support services, parents and caregivers, whatever role that we play, we all have a responsibility to create spaces where all families, no matter how you identify, truly feel welcomed, seen, supported, and safe to be their whole self. And one thing I would really want us to remember is that we are all bringing our whole selves to whatever space we occupy. So as staff, um, as parents, as families, as teachers, as um, administrators, we are all bringing our whole selves. And so when we ask families to come in and bring their whole selves, the first thing that we have to remember is for this to be possible, we all must do the work to make this happen. 
And it starts with us as individuals. You know, in order to bring our whole selves into the spaces, we have to be willing to look inward and do that internal work. You know, that comes with first acknowledging that possibly we have biases, um, acknowledging and addressing them, and just really reflecting on the mindsets that have helped shape who we are in this moment and how we perceive the world and how we relate to others. Before we can do this hard work, it's going to be a little more challenging to be able to authentically and genuinely welcome families from all walks of life into the space without having done that internal work and being really mindful of your body language, of your facial expressions when you welcome a family in that aesthetically may appear different from how they are verbally saying they identify. It's the little things that really matter and that leave a lasting impression. And this is what we really want to hone in on this evening. When we do that hard work, we'll be more in a position to effectively work together as a teaching team, like I said, or school administrators or director of family resources, et cetera. Next slide, please. So when we think about and talk about identities and LGBT identities, um, we're sometimes lovingly called the alphabet soup communities. Um, there's a lot of us, there's a lot of different ways that we identify um, and language can be so important to articulating ourselves and to communicating to others what we want them to know about who we are. Um, that said, a lot of times we get bogged down in this is lesbian means um, so a woman who loves women. Bisexual means someone who loves people um, or, or loves men and women or loves added, you know, people, let me find that sentence again, that bisexual means people who could, could be attracted to someone of another, of the same gender another or another gender. Um, and we want you to have a resource that you can go to to help you start to understand all of the words, all of the identities in that. So we're gonna post one in the chat now. But remember, these languages is evolving. People are finding new words for themselves, finding ways to articulate themselves. So no matter what list you get now, you will need to be open to being curious about learning more. We did wanna highlight one question that often comes up, which is the difference between cisgender, which is the word for cis, which is Latin or, or the scientific term for unchanging um, and gender. So. Uh, basically meaning if you are a cisgender, the guess they gave you at birth, based on your body, based on um, what the, those things mean, that guess fits. It didn't change. Um, your gender didn't change. And that for trans, it's a, again, it's a change. So for it's a big umbrella term for folks who um, who's, was assigned one thing based on a guess about what their body was saying and as somebody not that doesn't fit that guess, that changes from that guess. Um, and that there's also people who identify as male, female, and not a part of the binary, or both male and female. And that folks in that both and space or neither often use the term non-binary to describe themselves. So those are languages about gender that isn't always available to folks. Um, we wanted to have accessible. We also want to shift that into this perspective about children, because understanding who's in your community, who's in your family, and who you can grow up to be starts in early childhood. For so many of us, we don't have words for who we are. And we grow, end up growing up in isolation or in shame and in hiding because we don't know how to fit who we are and express who we are in the world. In my own story, I knew the rules of gender and that I didn't fit them so young that I hid them and I hid them so quickly. Um, my family didn't know how to understand me as I came, as I grew up. I also want to note that romantic, like, and that, that what we can do as early childhood educators is create spaces where the language is known, where children are known, and where families can talk with each other about who we are. Um, we also want to know that romantic identities like bisexual or straight or asexual or lesbian or gay develop in adolescence and beyond but that family diversity and gender identity develops, it starts now. 
that, that it develops in early childhood um, and that we can grow and change throughout our lives, but that kids know who they are and that it's our job to listen to them and support them and meet them where they are. Uh, and we just that note that sometimes comes up when with this conversation, because oftentimes the bias is similar, um, but the, that gender identity is not the same as sexual orientation. We are all part of a big community, um, and but that that's not one person or one person's identity, but that you need to get to know someone to know them, not just their labels. Daniel, and, and you know, I really want everyone to really sit with what Nathaniel said around uh, identities and gender and having that innate sense of who you are, how you identify. It truly does start very early in age. And one another reason why we are really emphasizing this is really because feeling able to show your true gender identity is so important to your emotional and mental health. Um, I have noticed with the children that I have worked with when I was teaching um, ballet um, at the Y in Berkeley, my classes started from three. So I taught from three to 15. But my three-year-olds, I had one uh, little boy who at three truly felt like a little girl. His mother supported him, um, allowed him to wear tutus and tiaras, and he came in and he used she, her pronouns. Um, and as a teacher, what I chose to do is support him. I asked the mother I got a little bit more background on how she supported him at home, how she would like me to support him and welcome him and identify him. Um, and then I talked with him and I did my best to encourage the other dancers in the class to do the same. And so this is just something that whether, you know, gender, sexual identity, we're all evolving as people, you know, we're there, there's nothing that's set. <laughs> And when we feel like we're set in anything, the universe will smile at you and say, guess what? I'm going to just add a little bit of something in that makes you feel like, oh, wait, maybe I feel a little different. So with that in mind, yes, everything is fluid. But in those moments, when you work with little ones, the best thing you can do is support them, is meet them where they're at is talk with their families, see how they welcome them, see how they support them. This is how we create these welcoming spaces. This is how we help children feel safe in our presence. This is how we create these opportunities for them to thrive, for them to become more of who they will evolve into as they grow older. Gender expression or identity expression, it's about how you demonstrate who you are. It can play out in a variety of ways. And using myself as an example, I was assigned female at birth. My gender identity is female. I am very centered in being a black woman. I express myself in what we would note as gender conforming ways, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> and I say that because we generally say, oh, women wear makeup, uh, women wear dresses, women wear high heels, women wear nail polish. That is true to who I choose to identify with. And that is how I choose to express my gender. But gender expression can take a myriad um, of manifestations. And so you may see your children come into your, your uh, classroom and your student may be biologically a male and may come in a dress. Your student may be biologically a female and like to play what you would assume is 
a boys game or with trucks or likes to, you know, say I'm going to be a fireman and use the pronouns that we generally associate with the male. These are just ways that children are exploring. They're exploring their identity, how they want to express themselves. They haven't quite settled into it yet, or they may have. And it's up to us to just go with it, just be there for it, really get to know them, and just kind of support it. When we stifle children's ability to express their identity, it truly does have an effect on their mental health. So this is just something that I would encourage everyone, even when it feels in your mind a little confusing or maybe goes a, a bit against how your perception of someone's identity should be expressed. I encourage you to just go with your child, go with that student, just allow them that sense of adventure, that sense of exploration. Gender expression from an early age, kids truly do understand both simple and complex ideas of gender identity. And as adults, as parents, as teachers, they're learning and absorbing the categories that we teach them. And then they eventually find their place within or beyond those categories, which is why we want to do the best that we can do to expand our perception, our understanding, our knowledge, so that when we're dropping these seeds of knowledge that these children are soaking up, we're allowing them to really expand um, their understanding and it, we're giving them that room to grow. You know, the, the surprising truth is that we really all do have an, our own innate sense of who we are. Um, and then really the funny thing is that we spend most of our lives searching for the words or the tools, the safety in the agency to share ourselves with the world. And this just kind of takes us back to the why that we're here, why that we're learning from one another is just to create these kind of environments so that our children do feel that sense of agency and safety to explore themselves. And the other That's piece why. we want to note with identity is that identity is more than just one thing. Um, that there's identity, there's overlapping identities. So children are going to need more than one thing, and children with the same gender identity won't necessarily need the same thing because they'll have more identities to lay, that are are part of that. Um, and one of the things I also want to highlight is that so often we hear this idea that being silent about LGBT folks. Um, is protective of children, that these are mature or adult topics and that kids can wait to learn them later. But what we need, to, what we also need to recognize is that silence teaches and it teaches, it doesn't teach that lesson, right? It teaches the idea that this is scare, a scary topic. How dangerous is it if adults can't even talk about it? And it leaves children without language for the diversity they see in the world, for their questions, and for and even for themselves. And it leaves children to draw on media, marketing, and other children for information. So let's take a moment just to look at what's out there for kids if we're not talking. So on this slide, you can see some pretty like things that kids have a lot of access to. And we're gonna ask you to post in the chat what stereotypes and bias you see in these kids' projects. So to get you started, one of the things I see is that dolls are for girls. Yeah, there's coming up is cooking and nature are for girls, caregivers and mothers, the boys like dinosaurs, but girls don't. Families with just moms and dads only. Pink for girls, blue for boys. Dinos building for boys. There's just so that. Yeah, men are great at building in math. Um, and that, that there's these topics are for certain people that women wear skirts, men, moms wear skirts, men wear ties, men wear shorts. Um, that these things are only available to some of us. But we know that these pieces, like toys are toys. 
Dresses are dresses, clothes are clothes. Um, cooking is cooking, it feeds all of us. Yeah, someone's also pointing out in the chat that um, you're, these pieces are, are limited by race as well, right? The families are all the same race, they look very similar. Um, the, the black dolls are for black girls, not for everyone. Um, so we can see that these messages aren't the messages that we want to tell kids, right? We want kids to feel like things are accessible, things are welcome, and that we can shift into having age-appropriate conversations instead. So one of the things that we wanted to share are different talking points and different ways that you can begin to have conversations with families. So there are lots of different ways to be a family. You get to tell us about who you are. Everything at our school is for everyone. Anyone can pretend. You don't have to be a boy to pretend to be Superman. These are just some talking points. When you are in a dialogue with a little one um, or even a family, there are times where, for example, I have had families who have asked about different books that we have um, where it's showing to moms or to dads. And from their understanding, a family is a mother and a father. And it's something that we just have to think of as a teaching moment, a moment to expand someone's perspective and understanding of what a family is. Because sometimes you'll come across someone who is just ignorant of the fact that you can actually be a family um, and not share those dynamics of male and female. And this is just um, different ways that we can begin to have that conversation. It definitely has helped. I have used um, the, not necessarily uh, Superman line, but I've definitely said um, anyone, can pretend to be anyone um, to some students uh, because sometimes even the little ones, you know, grow up. We this kind of goes back into the silence teaches and what kids are going to grasp onto. They're very observant. And a lot of times we take for granted when they're as young as three or four that they're not really paying attention to what the grown-ups may be talking about. Um, but they really are. They're taking, they're soaking it in and only the way that a three or four year old can, of course their processing is gonna be very different. So the intent of that conversation will get filtered through a three year old's mind and will come out looking a lot differently um, and their belief in what they can or can do or what their limitations are um, will be um, very stifling at times and we'll have them thinking that they can only wear this or they can only play with this. And so this is something that I think as uh, teachers, as anyone who is working with families and little ones, um, I would definitely encourage to just be mindful of uh, as you're designing your classroom or as you're designing an activity um, for your little ones um, or even some curriculum, um, diversity books. All of that will really, really help if you're mindful, particularly when it comes to gender. And that we need to be mindful that uh, we sometimes create the change. If you could go back in the slides, please. But we sometimes need to create the change we need to see. For example, with the dollhouse families, sometimes we're going to get families um, that we're not going to be able to find that family in the dollhouse things, but we can trade dolls with other classrooms in our community or in our school. We can be mindful to shift things around. We can think about how we create representation um, because representation matters. Um, the other thing that comes up often is questions about pronouns and speaking with kids about kids. Um, and as John's story said before, um, kids are exploring. Kids will sometimes ask for different pronouns and that we need to hold that with respect and kindness and also with communication with the families. Um, so we wanted to share one example to give you a chance to practice because this is something that often comes up is I run into these moments when I, I want to get there, but I just don't know how or just doesn't come out or just doesn't flow. 
Um, and just to remind you that you can practice those skills that you know you're running into, that we all have that ability to learn and practice. So even though you're muted, um, I'm going to invite you to, to speak along with me um, this, to just practice saying these words. So the, in this example, well, imagine that Rowan is a child in your in a new child in your classroom. Rowan's parents have chosen to use they them pronouns for Rowan until Rowan chooses a particular gender identity. So, oh, I'm going to give him a moment to read through the scenario, and then we'll read it together, or filling in what pronoun goes in those spaces. So at group time, you share with the children that a new student will be joining the class saying, Rowan is joining our classroom. They start next week. Their family shared some pictures with us so you can see who's coming. Here's a photo of them playing dress up. What do you think Rowan needs to know when they start in our classroom? How can we help them feel comfortable on their first day? And you can take a picture of the slide and sort of revisit that process of practicing. If you can move into the next slide. Okay, this brings us into inclusive learning communities. What helps us feel welcome, connected, or at home. And those of us who have a little bit more uh, background in child development, child development may really remember some of the theorists who really focus on environment, creating that environment that will allow a child as soon as they come in to be able to see themselves in that space. And this is something that I think we're always striving to do, whether it's a classroom, whether it's a family resource center, whether it's a Head Start program, you can name one. We are all trying to make sure that when our children, our students, a family, when they step into our space, they feel like they can see themselves there. They can be themselves there. And one thing, is that we want them to be able to be their whole selves, which we sort of talked about earlier. And one thing I think is important to think about when we think about how do you feel welcome? How do you feel connected? What makes them feel like they're at home? How do they bring their whole selves? We really should take a moment just to think about intersectionality and how that plays out. You know, how do our intersecting identities shape our perspectives? and the way we experience the world, you know, and vice versa. How do our identities shape the way the world perceives us and experiences us? I can say from using myself and using the I, as I mentioned in the community guidelines, using myself as an experience or as an example, this is something that comes up for me um, being part of the LGBTQ community. I identify as a Black woman, a lesbian, a mother, an educator, etc. And I bring my whole self on any given day in whatever space I'm in. And when I'm with my partner and when we have our children, this is something that we are mindful of. We are bringing our whole selves into the space with our children. And so we need to know that can our children be their whole selves? Can they feel safe? Can we feel safe? bring in us as a family into this space. And so this is something I encourage everyone to be mindful of. It's because not everyone has a chance to really unpack that, you know, and particularly when it comes to those of us who identify as part of the LGBTQ community, it adds an extra layer, an additional layer to this intersectionality. Um, because when you were trying to understand if we can feel safe to walk, into a space, you know, you add that the colorism piece, you can add the race piece, but when you add the gender identity, when you add the sexual orientation piece, this is just something that families that you may be welcoming already 
may be grappling with and may not necessarily have felt safe enough to express to you that they are part of this community. So this is something to be mindful of. Some may have felt comfortable sharing with you, but there's a real possibility that others haven't. And so we want to make sure that what we're doing is creating a space where all families, regardless of the makeup, do feel comfortable and do feel safe. And so it really is important to practice pronouns. It's really important to ask families, how do they want to be welcomed? How would they like to be identified as? How would they like us to call? What would, we, what would they like us to call them when we welcome them into the space? It really makes a difference because it lets people know that we see them, that they are seen um, and that we're not taking for granted that we're only using the aesthetic um, to identify someone else, but we're allowing them to identify themselves and we are truly welcoming them and allowing them to be part of this community um, that we're trying to create in whatever the spaces that we occupy. This is just something that is really important. Um, I think to just remember that we all have a lot of intersecting identities, um, including the families and the little ones. And on that note, language is one of the things that makes gender or identity, um, family diversity, a tricky thing to talk about because language is so often just a reflex. Um, language demands that we guess someone's pronoun to talk about them. Language, right? If we don't take time to slow down that reaction, that story that I was told as a child that the polite thing is to do is to figure someone else out before you talk to them. And though you can say the right thing from the get-go um, and that that creates this demand on people that if we can slow that down, if we can slow down our reactive space and get curious about people um, and ask those questions like Don was saying, um, and then just highlight language that for me feels really loaded, um, feels like I'm not sure you're thinking about me. So one example of that is when people say, hey, moms and daddies come back and don't include Papas or mamas or papas or just other ways that kids can speak language or don't think about parents, caregivers, adults, or your person and here's their name will come back um, to get you tonight. Right. So thinking about how to make it, how to pull that context out of, of what's sort of seen as traditional or normal or average for your community. Right, Like if you're in a classroom where every child has a mom and a dad, it's so easy to slip into mommies and daddies. But those children need to know about diversity too, because they're going to be in situations where that's not what it is. Um, and that they deserve that chance to be curious, be connected, get to know someone too, to have those skills so that they don't break down their relationships with people in these ways. Um, so again, we're going to post a, a resource in the link um, or resource in the chat. Um, that is a link to uh, just more examples of ways to think about um, particularly gender. This, this one's created by an organization that focuses on gender. Um, and so ways to think about language that comes up that signals to people, you haven't necessarily thought about this and gives you some alternatives of things to try. Um, and just to think about that piece of creating inclusive and in, then in expansive environments comes down to skills that we have as teachers all the time. It comes down to listening to children and their ideas. It comes down to asking them questions and thinking about things with them. It comes down to creating a space for it to explore and to be really thoughtful about what exploration, what opens up exploration for children. Because for some children, that chance to put on the skirt, that chance to put on the uniform, um, like this child in the picture who got to try on the, like the, the NASA uniform and the, the skirt and just put it all together and just be, find this joyful moment of dress up and fun. Um, that can be such an opening for children to get a chance to say, hey, these are the things that signify gender and this is my chance to play with it. Other children get shut down by that without opportunity and that it's in things like fabric and taking out those things that signify to them that this is for boys or this is for girls because of the cultures they've come from um, and the things that are in the world 
that they re they recreate in themselves. They take in unless we help them think about it critically. So if we can pull back and have those moments for or where exploration opens up through either gender neutral or just really open-ended materials, that's another thing we can offer children. And we also need to remember that representation matters. We need to find resources that show kids it's that non-binary people exist, that gender is okay to, to have questions about, that families look many different ways. Um, and so resources like books can be incredible, as Don mentioned before, um, and that sometimes books provide that representation and sometimes books create situations where you get to ask questions. So for example, the book Granddad's Camper talks about uh, granddad and grandpa um, and their relationship, but it also features a child who does, whose identity is never mentioned. So they can then you can find out from kids what their guess is and why, and to talk about that in other spaces. We can also model things like asking kids what their pronoun stuffies are and creating spaces for them to identify and explore that space of, oh, this is a question that can be asked. I don't just have to guess. All right, we have a practice, um, practicing inclusion for you. A mom at your school approaches you, wanting to check in about something that happened with her daughter, Nia. She says, my wife shared that Nia came home from school yesterday asking, where's my dad? We talked about our family and how families can be different over dinner, but I'm worried about Nia starting to feel like our family is incomplete or somehow wrong just because it's different from some of her friends' families. Could you tell me more about how you talk about family diversity at school? This is a moment to just reflect. You can reflect with your teaching team. You can reflect with your coworkers, with administrators. How do you talk about family diversity with children? How do you include it in your curriculum? This is something that you don't necessarily have to have an answer right now, but definitely a reflection point to consider because this is definitely something that takes more than just a few moments to be able to come up with a truly, truly thought out um, and effective um, answer and strategy. But please keep this in mind. You can also take a picture um, as you did on the slide, the previous slide. And I know some of you already have these strategies in place. So if you do have a chance to share your strategies in the chat, that's great. And we want to give time for breakout groups. So we're going to keep going. Um, so do please, please do feel comfortable if you have a strategy of how you do it to post that in the chat for people to see. Um, but we do want to talk about working with discomfort and we want to hold some time for that because it is one of the bi biggest questions I get on this topic is, okay, I feel comfortable working with LGBTQ who plus families or in creating a safe space for children to just get to explore, to get to try on dresses, to get to try on bow ties um, and suits and all the different things that represent gender. Or, but what do I do when a family or a coworker is uncomfortable? How do I handle that moment of somebody else not wanting me to do this? And one of the things I think about is it's so easy to jump to jump into a reactive mode. I have to answer their question. I have to solve it now. I have to figure it out. Um, how, how do I make them comfortable? How do I make them feel a certain way? Um, and that to give yourself that chance to take a breath and step out of that reactive mode um, or that defensive mode where you want to protect your school or you want to protect the children. Um, and just to take that moment to take a breath and encourage yourself to give yourself time to think about what you like to think about it now so that you have a sense of what to do and to remember there's a strategy of saying thank you so much for sharing your concern uh, i really want to have time to hear and understand you can we schedule a meeting to connect when are you available so that de-escalates the moment and moves it off of the floor in front of children where the conversation's happening and then i really recommend um, thinking a lot about who engages with the person 
uh, right? Like I, if you do identify as LGBTQ+, sometimes you're the perfect person to have that conversation. And sometimes it is so much to have a family be uncomfortable about your existence. And it needs to be someone else that takes in that first response and listens. And the other thing is to really be ready to listen to parents when you come in. Those concerns that come up often come from an underlying question and underlying concern. Will my child be bullied? Are you letting them um, put themselves at risk? How do you think about my culture? How do you represent me in this space? How do you, how are you gonna work with me? And to really think about those underlying questions and address them. So if the question is like, I'm so scared about you putting, like letting my children do this, I think they're gonna get teased. How do you address teasing at your school? Why, like, right? Like what, how are you gonna address those things? How are you gonna do those things? Well, also holding space for, and children need to do this. Children get to do this. Um, and like to help them think, like the, to help adults think through those spaces. And so just, oh. yeah. Moving into, just because of time, I think we need to skip into resources, unfortunately, Don, um, mm -hmm. and just know that there is, we have links to resources um, for how to continue thinking about this, how, who you can reach out to for support, um, continuing trainings, continue like resources, information about schools that's coming into the chat right now. Um, and that, since we wanna give you time for breakout groups, um, We'll switch, we'll shift questions for now, but do feel free to push post questions you have in the chat and we will get to them if we have time. Thank you so very much, Nathaniel and Don, for your amazingly wonderful presentations. <clears throat> you both offered such rich knowledge and inclusive strategies for us all to reflect upon. And as we reflect, we invite you to, as Nathaniel said, place your questions in the chat and we will address those either in a follow-up email or at the end of tonight's symposium. And now let's move on to our breakout sessions, an interactive opportunity for you to reflect upon uh, tonight's topic. <clears throat> in your breakout sessions, you will have a facilitator in your breakout group who will lead you through an activity and we will all meet back here at the close of the symposium at around 7.55. Diana, you can now launch the breakout rooms. Thanks, Drew. All right, everyone, enjoy your breakout rooms. Welcome back, everyone. If your interpretation is turned off, please reselect English, Spanish, or Chinese again. Thank you to everyone for your participation and for this energizing discussion in the small groups. We hope that you take this energy as you cultivate safe and welcoming programs for children, families, and our beautiful community. This symposium is put together by Oakland Starting Smart and Strong. We'll put a link to their website in the chat because they have lots of amazing resources for early learning professionals. We will send out an email with a meeting evaluation form. Please fill it out. We really want to hear your feedback about this and to help us inform our future events. This email will also include your professional development certificate for tonight and also any resources shared by our amazing speakers. A reminder that we hope to see you in person on Saturday for the book pickup and breakfast at Bananas, which goes from noon, or I'm sorry, 10 to noon. If you, uh, you do need to register for this separately to RSVP for the in-person event. So please keep an eye out for the email if you would like to attend the Saturday's training and register to attend. Also, thanks to our interpreters, speakers, facilitators, the Oakland Starting Smart and Strong staff, 
the symposium planning team, Tandem, and the Packard and Rainin Foundations. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, and you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.